everything will be free. All the all the food will be free. It will be provided through uh, small uh, small businesses uh, on the west side. Uh, uh, be all Mexican food. Uh, Thursday night when we have the 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 kind of like the grand opening to the two day conference. Uh, it's going to be Thursday night. We're hoping to have some you know dancers and mariachis. Uh, uh, we're going to be serving pan dulce with coffee. The first evening is going to be about maybe three four hours. We might be at the end uh, putting a, a movie up there called Why Didn't She Leave as part of uh, going into the conference of for men and masculinity. Um, so there will be food provided throughout the conference for all two days, two and a half days. Uh, we also have over 12 national speakers coming in from all over the United States, from the West Coast, East Coast, Mid Coast, uh, uh, Midwest, East, uh, the Midwest. Uh, all these are subject matter experts. I mean, if you just look at their names, I'll, I'll put something in the in the uh, chat here in a minute. Uh, these people come with tons and tons of credentials. Some people even have buildings named after them. So it's going to be going to be very exciting. They're going to bring a lot of news uh, from a different perspective. That I've been doing this work for ten years. Patricia's been doing this work for forty years, which is why we're backing this because it's a perspective in which even we haven't even you know heard from. So, so what's the nuts and bolts, Sammy? Where is it being held? Being held. And is what's yeah, being, I, I got it. I got it in the chat, but I'll put it in here in a minute. But okay, good. Know, good. The, the neighborhood place uh, at the west side, uh, right there by uh, by uh, Holy Cross High School, and uh, we have extended hours that we had to pay for some extended hours to keep the building open. Uh, and then uh, on Friday night, we have a Pulitzer Prize, Tony nominated winning play from Broadway coming in to be shown as well live with all the actors from New York, uh, wow. which will be a very nice thing to see. And the play is called What Does the Constitution Mean to Me? Mm. Uh, so it's going to be very thought-provoking uh, uh, conference for sure. Like I said, coming from a different perspective and a lens uh, that, like I said, me and Patricia haven't seen before or heard. And we figure and we see that it's a very important that people here actually see uh, what are the ways we could work together to try to put a stop to domestic violence, abuse, and all these other social issues that are causing massive havoc in San Antonio and all over the world. So, Thanks. Doug, you want to give us the nuts and bolts? Yeah. Pathways? Uh, so August 23rd and 24th, Pathways to Hope. This will be the ninth year. It's a conference on mental health and community and how we, uh, and it, it'll have 24 different workshops, plenary speakers. Uh, it's free. I put the link in the uh, chat uh, and we hope to see you. It's a great event. And if you don't know why you should be coming, just come and you will enjoy it. Well, thank you both for those. And I, I already saw Sammy's pop up and I know Doug will do that. Anyone else who has announcements, if you would just put those into chat. We want to jump into the film. Uh, I, I will put into chat as well. It's public access. So it's available online and you can go to it at any time not just in this recording, but uh, through the HEB Foundation as well. Um, I was telling others earlier that it is, I've been to lots of briefings on housing and our situation in San Antonio, but this by far is the best, most condensed version. So it would be something really useful to show in congregations, in organizations, in team meetings. If you wanna get people just kind of with the basics, on the same page and a place to at least start, if not continue conversations, um, I, I recommend this. And they, we're just gonna show it. So let's hope this works. And I did test it out on our early arrivers and they said they could see and hear, and that seems to be the most important thing. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, everyone needs a home and I'll put the information in chat where you can find it. Stay as long as you can. We'll have a couple questions and things afterwards, but if you need to leave, just feel free to do that. Everyone needs a home. It's as basic as food, water, and clothing, but it's getting harder and harder for families in San Antonio to have one or to keep one. Why is that? 
We've been trying to wrap our heads around this complex question that affects a lot of us. It's a deeply personal issue, and it's also about our whole community. And new at five, home prices, they continue to climb to the rafters. Skyrocketing home prices. It's a U.S. housing crisis that's hitting San Antonio as well these days. Last month, the median price of homes sold here was $311,000. $317,000. $326,000. $375,000. Buyers are getting stuck in bidding wars. The average interest on a 30-year mortgage is over 7%, close to a two-decade high. We've been talking to people all across our city. This effort is part of a larger project at the H.E. Butt Foundation called Know Your Neighbor, where we listen to the stories of our neighbors and how they're experiencing all kinds of complex challenges. We're trying to live our dreams. We're trying to have a home. I want to know, like, you know, I, I, I want to own my own home. That's, that's my thing. I was, when I finally got the keys, oh man, it was like the happiest day for me, seriously. Housing is a system of policies, rules, and regulations. It's a market that goes up and down, and that sometimes seems to change overnight. It's a history of development that many of us don't see or understand. But it's also memories and family. It's shared meals and bedtime stories. Housing is about home, and everyone needs a home. Before my daughter, it was like, I stayed with, with a friend. It wasn't like the best place to stay at, especially for a teenager, but they gave me somewhere to lay my head at, and I, I took that. And that was like my first time really experiencing not having a home. Being homeless kind of sucked. Uh, but I would never really tell anybody my situation. But I was in survival mode. I, I've been in survival mode for a really long time. I just love tacos. I can't stop eating them. But my favorite kind of taco I actually have two, um, but my favorite favorite, it's bean and cheese. Then my second favorite, it's, what's it called? Carne de sada with cheese. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I was 21 when I had my daughter. And honestly, when I first had her, like just looking at her and holding her, I was like, whoa, this is mine. Like, I have to raise you. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm your mom. Like, <laughs> so just having her really pulled me back into myself and like, hey, we, we need to, we need to make it and we need to do stuff for her and make sure that she's good. Love you too, Mom. Have a good day. Can you? You know, at the, the root, the base of it is that individuals need safe, quality housing. They need that for themselves. They need that from their for their families. They need that so their families can succeed. So we've identified in San Antonio, there's 95,000 vulnerable households, people that are cost burdened, that are spending more than 30% of their take home pay on, on, on housing. But there's a lot of people that are at 50% of the median income. They can't find housing under $1,200 a month mortgage payment, which is roughly 30%. Then all of a sudden you have to make tough decisions about what you're going to give up. And they're, and they're primary things like food, gas that affects employment. I'm 
going to feed my family. I've, I've got to have gas in my car to go to work. And I'm going to keep the lights on. So the shortfall goes defaults to the rent. And so I'll get behind and I'll figure something out and, you know, pay the late fees. And so then it just spirals from there. Take the taser? Yeah, I'll take the taser. All right. Hello, hello. Susan. Hello, hello. Constable's office. Clear. Come over, come over here so I can talk to you. Come over, sir. And you have 24 hours to get your stuff. Um, and you know about the trailer. You have to move within 24 hours. I'm I'm not what. Yeah. She's, she's getting some stuff. Go ahead and let's start. I've been doing this for 22 years. It got stuck. People, and it's a big spectrum from criminal activity to pay rent to, you know, the, the bank's foreclosing. Uh, you can't pay your taxes. The, the county's taking taking your property away to sell or to pay those taxes. Uh, it's, it's just a big eye-opener, you know. When I first started in 2001, and it was a mother and three daughters, uh, and uh, I, was, I was leaving the property, and there was a, the couch on the parking lot. And the three girls, probably the oldest one was 10, were sitting on the couch I was leaving. And and that that really uh, that really hurt me like, wow, I'm gonna be doing this for the rest of my career, you know? Uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I made sure they had someone to drink and, and uh, uh, I came back with snacks and stuff. And, and the, the mother assured me that they were, they were going with some family members, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> well, you know, that was the first one I did, and and here we are, 22 years later, you know, so. Next one. Next one. For families in need of affordable housing, there are two main government programs they can take advantage of public housing, and vouchers. San Antonio has about 6,000 public housing units and just over 14,000 housing vouchers, which can be used to pay for rent. As we've talked with folks who have used both of these programs, they told us about long waiting lists to know if you're even approved. They've talked about facing evictions, but they've also talked about very restricted opportunities even when they do land a home. Public housing and places that take vouchers are concentrated into a handful of areas of town with limited resources for them and their kids. They lack things as basic as good sidewalks and streets and vital resources like healthcare. I had known about housing for a long time. So I applied, I think when my daughter was like maybe three years old, two years old, somewhere around there. I didn't know how to um, fill out the application. 
And I, I think the first time I had applied for like a disabled property, like for people with disabilities and stuff. So when I got that call, I was like, and they asked me like, do you have any disabilities? And I was like, uh, no, I don't. Can I switch it? Because I was basically requesting to live at that property. And they were like, no, you just have to put in another, another application and wait again. And I was like, dude, like I gotta wait another two, three, four years before y'all call me. Like, it, it was really frustrating. I was really upset. Oh, I should have researched it. I should have known what I was applying for. Like, whether I had help or not, I should have, like, just paid more attention to what I was doing when I was doing it. So there I went again, doing the housing application one more time. So I just applied for family public housing. So I waited another two, three years and then finally got the correct place. I was, when I finally got the keys, oh man, it was like the happiest day for me, seriously. Wouldn't it be cool if she has two tails? When I, when I realized how much help there is out here for people, it's just that you have to qualify, you have to be persistent, you have to make sure you have all the correct paperwork. Um, it, it's a, you got to put effort into it as well, you know? It's just about knowing about the resources, because I realized a lot of people don't know about all the help there is out here. We would say, like, in our time, you know, last 10 years on the east side, like, Housing stability is the, the first thing you need for health to occur. <laughs> Let's not even worry about wealth. Like, we're just, if we're trying to get people to health, like healthy family, healthy education, healthy job, housing stability is critical. And everything that's happened in the past 10 years has made that more difficult. We, so we grew up in the Lincoln Court projects and apartments all our life. We ended up moving with my father, and uh, he had a home. It's always been driven in my head to own my own spot. Like, so wherever I go, I want to own it, you know? And that's what I want to give my kids. It's like the foundation. The buck stops now. And that's why I was like, you know what? This is what it is. I got to do it. I got to sacrifice. But we're not going to have this continual circle going on in the Brown House. It stops now. Everybody's going to start gaining and building generational wealth from now to the end. And so that's how important. That's how important owning a home is to me, and because it starts there. There's, there's a lot of debate from an economic perspective of is it better to rent or is it better to own? But it's not even about that. It's about housing security. It's about being able to know that you have a home and what happens with that home is your decision. But that is something that is very commonly out of reach for most families. In most people's cases, it's the largest um, source of their worth, the equity in a home. And it is, you know, they say don't buy a home for an investment, but truly long term, yeah, I would, I would disagree. I would say with just the pay down of that mortgage and, and the appreciation that's occurring and stuff like that. Uh, that's, a, that's a great asset to pass on a family and there's that pride of ownership and there's so many benefits from it. How are people, how are these families gonna to begin to create any kind of generational wealth if they don't have any assets? Yeah, it's easy to build multifamily housing and help solve the housing crisis, but people are never gonna own something to kind of start that. I worry more and more that the, the, the idea of the American dream is getting further and further away from us, right? I want to know, like, you know, I, I, I want to own my own home. That's, that's my thing. And uh, it, I looked at about eight houses, different homes, and um, I didn't get none at all. Everything's already set at a price that keeping you out, basically. 
And I mean, from my experience, like everything was already skyrocketing. Yeah, once I couldn't get me nothing to own, then I was like, well, let, let's just find something to rent, you know? So then you're forced to go back down to somewhere you don't want to be, you know, to find housing and to find somewhere to stay. And even then, it's hard to get into there. So then I end up moving here. So that's how I end up being here. Until we actually get to a point where, one, we either have housing security uh, for renters uh, wide, widespread, which is, is a really tough challenge, then we have to keep uh, encouraging people and helping them bridge that gap into home ownership uh, so that they can actually have a say in what happens with their property and the cost of their housing, and then also stand to benefit when things are happening in and around them. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and blood, sweat, and tears to build affordable housing. There's no free market incentive necessarily to building, you know, those affordable, you know, family units right now because those who are buying homes are in the higher end of the range. It's real simple economics of the less house you build, the less land you own, the cheaper it should be. Um, now, the way to flip that script is if I have a lot and rather than putting one house on it, I put four. That takes the cost of that dirt and divides it by four now, right? But then you look again at the rules. We created zoning because people were over-densifying. Well, people were over-densifying with simple economics. They couldn't afford to live in the housing. So is one of the beneficial things that we try to do that was more good for people is let's create zoning policies to protect these people. I believe in that, that was a good move. Government steps in and intervenes in the system to make sure we have basic, safe housing. Well, that could also get out of control too. What is the reason that most low income or mixed income housing projects don't happen in other areas. You'd find that in most cases, it's because of the zoning. It's because once there is an opportunity for the community to come out against it uh, and deny that zoning, that's where they die. And so instead, they get located closer to the inner city. The, the thing that, that I find frustrating with that is that, so why should somebody that rents not be allowed to be in your neighborhood? What's wrong with renters? I said, so when you vote against multifamily housing, you're actually voting against yourself from when you were recently graduated from college or recently uh, divorced or recently married, you know, when you didn't have a whole lot of money, but you wanted to be in the community. And, and that's the thing that's amazing to me about single family detached zoning is it actually keeps people from moving into the community. It's a barrier. That's a red line. Sometimes I feel the more I hear about this, the more I don't know. Every person we've talked to in this project makes me realize how much more there is to learn. There's more context to discover. There's a context of choices each of us make about where we live and where we buy our own home. And there's the context of the choices that are made by the powers that be, elected officials or big players in the market. The more context we get, the more the problem comes into focus. We moved here in 2015, and we had about two and a half, three days to look for a house. And I think this is a pretty common experience. People get a job across the country, and they have a short, you know, window in which to, to pick a home. We had three kids um, in middle school and younger, so we had a short window with which to make a really big commitment, you know, and decide which neighborhood are we going to live in in a city that we don't really know that well. Honestly, we weren't thinking about the city overall. We were just thinking about a place to land, kind of a soft landing, we kept saying, where we could find a home that what's at the intersection of what we can afford and where we think the schools are going to be good. And um, we settled into our neighborhood, and um, we loved our home and got to know our neighbors, and it felt like a pretty good landing for a while.
It was about a year after we got here that I was, um, I had insomnia one night. And so I got up in the middle of the night and I'm reading the Express News. It's about midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And uh, they had just started um, a new series in the paper called The Next Million. And it was about the tremendous growth of San Antonio. And it talked about how we're gonna keep growing, there's gonna need to be more development. And the question the reporter was asking is, where are all these people gonna go? She ended up talking about the whole history of development of San Antonio. Yeah. And then that night, like just reading that paper, I learned a lot about the city that I had moved into. I learned about, you know, the history of deed restrictions in the early days, early 20th century, where San Antonio was developed in whites only neighborhoods and neighborhoods where people who were of Mexican descent or African descent were not permitted to live legally. And then the history of redlining, where the federal government and banks kind of uh, work together to figure out where they could make quote unquote safe investments. Those were in neighborhoods where they knew that only white people lived. And it was eye opening. And I realized that the decision I had made a year before, quick decision, where are the good schools, where can I afford, was a decision that had actually a lot of consequences, um, a lot of implications for the meaning of that decision beyond just where I lived that I hadn't thought through before. Most of my career was in the city of San Antonio, and I worked in downtown redevelopment. And so the idea was, you know, how do we make our city more competitive by having a more attractive and competitive downtown, making our downtown a place where people want to be, where businesses want to be, where corporate headquarters want to be. And so it really kind of instilled in me this investment and focus on place. And that was kind of really my whole first foray into the understanding of gentrification and displacement because the focus was all about downtown and how do we make that the best it can be. The unintended consequence there is, okay, well, what happens in the market as a result? As one place gets hot, there starts to be investment and then there tends to be speculation. And if I'm making an investment, I need to maximize that investment. And maybe that tenant isn't the best way to maximize that investment. And so as a result, you end up with this unintended consequence of gentrification. And so I got to see that firsthand um, in the work we were doing, which is important from an economic perspective, but then the human factor of it was jarring. Uh, this is the case that we're taking up, uh, again, related to Mission Trails. Uh, we have 54 individuals signed up to speak. If this zoning change does occur, I'm pretty certain that I'm going to have to drop out of college. We're trying to live our dreams. We're trying to have a home. We're trying to get the city to vote no to the zoning change. We're waiting for a miracle. We want the city to actually stand up, protect it, protect us, you know? This zoning case, of course, uh, is one uh, which we have to give a very long and hard deliberation to, and which during the course of the hearing four weeks ago and today, many of the residents who have spoken have given the council a lot to think about. Well, good evening. Developers couldn't move forward with this project until the city agreed to rezone this land to allow for those high-end apartments. The council could have done that last month, but decided to hold off on a decision until today. We have no plan for displaced residents. They have no place to go. Do we have to become animals so we can get your support? Yes, when we grow and when we become a wonderful big city, what is the story going to be told of how we treated the most vulnerable people in our community? The property along the, on, along the river, especially on the south side, the river before it was picked up was a drainage ditch. And so who lived along it? It was a lot, a lot of trailer parks. Right? Um, and really vital little communities, um, but they were low income.
whenever we invest in a particular place, because it's a fixed, immobile investment, and that investment impacts the things around it. The really productive public investments that we have made recently, and the easiest to envision is the Riverwalk. That property becomes more valuable, it becomes more sought after, the demand for that property goes way up because people want to be next to these beautiful new public investments. That's private property. The city doesn't have any say over that. They have a say in terms of zoning. Beyond that, that's, that's private property. And this is the state of Texas. And that's the, the, like the most cherished right that we have, is the, the right to do what we want on private property. So it flipped, it, those, those things flipped immediately. And now we've got these uh, you know, condominium complexes where we used to have trailer parks. Thank you very much for your patience. We will now uh, resume our city council meeting. How do we reconcile the fact you want to stay and the property owner wants to sell? If we were to vote no, that the owner would then come and just evict everybody. I just want to stay on your property. That's what, that's what you want. But I'm here to tell you that's not something we can give you, unfortunately. And so I felt like there weren't really any options. I, for one, will have the guts to vote yes because I want to protect you even if you don't understand that this would be the best option for you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please vote. All right, motion carries. That means that the zoning has passed six votes to four votes. All right, that uh, concludes our city council meeting. Thank you all very much. Through the 1960s, um, housing was highly valued for its use value. This is my home and people would stay in their home for a lifetime. federal government creates what are called real estate investment trusts, right? which makes real estate a comparable investment strategy to stocks and bonds. It doesn't take off right away, but 1986 recession, where we saw hundreds of thousands of foreclosures, right? And so much housing being available and capital kind of ready and willing to kind of swoop in, gather up these houses as a new and kind of investment strategy. That happens again in 2008. When we see what happens in the real estate market, lots and lots of houses on the market, undervalued, capital swoops in and, and buys all of these houses up. And who is this? Is that this, these are, it's, it's like, it's the, the equivalent of mutual funds. What's really driving this is, is, is this, that kind of speculative opportunity of making a ton of money. This is global. This is global capital coming in and and flying around our landscape right now. These are people coming from around the world and looking at a place like San Antonio that's got property that's depreciated, property that's still close to the, to the inner city where we've invested in a lot of beautiful public spaces, trying to make it really safe. Like, you know, we put on, you know, we fixed it up. This has become really valuable. Everybody's prices are going up and our checks aren't so, kind of scary, the outcome, actually. All right.
we should be pulling up here. So I know a lot of people from out of state are coming into San Antonio and kind of, they're kind of buying real estate. They're people from California or people from different uh, states. And I noticed that quite a bit. So again, like good and bad. I, I don't know the specifics about, you know, why they're coming and, you know, maybe it's cheaper here in San Antonio to live. That's your copy there. Thank you. These uh, investors, they buy these homes cheap and flip them or rent them out. And they just, they were, she was in a hurry to do so. I wish them, I wish them luck. See how that goes. There was a recent report that showing that over 40% of homes in San Antonio in 2021 were bought by LLCs, which is to say they weren't bought by individuals who were planning on living in them. They're maybe using them as short-term rentals. They may be using them as rehabs. Um, and what they're essentially doing is taking those homes off the market for San Antonians. Couples that are out looking first-time home buyers and stuff, they're competing with institutional investors that are taking that property off the market and converting it to a rental unit. All right, moving right along. Case number 2011 TA102563. Vernon Del Vernon, City San Antonio, Bear County, Texas. I have a minimum bid start net, 6,000. You're just waving. Careful. The first Tuesday of every month, uh, properties that are getting foreclosed on, whatever the case is, uh, they get here and the investors come out to bid on them so they can just purchase the property. 66,000. Going once. 66,000. 67,000. 83,000. 89,000 going twice. 90, 95,000. Sold the gentleman in the cap for 96,000. We get a bunch of off-market properties in our inventory and we try to find an investor to fix, flip them, uh, rent them out or Airbnb them. Yeah, so I build houses in uh, San Antonio and Bernie. Uh, I'm here today at the auction because I have a client who is interested in building a house in Bernie. So we found two lots that were available for sale at the sheriff's auction because the HOA dues had not been paid. And we thought we could pick up a deal on those two lots, which we did. Well, I am a real estate broker in San Antonio and I represent investors that buy at auction. So we're here some bot placing bids on, on properties. 13,000? I mean, honestly, everybody here is looking for a deal. So uh, trying to find, you know, where the market price and the price we can get it here are different. The owners of the property have defaulted in the payments and the payment and performance of their obligations to the association. The association has requested me as substitute trustee to conduct this sale. Without this, uh, you have people that aren't abiding by the rules. And without these rules in place, nobody pays their bills. This is the only thing keeping from people from actually stopping paying, because otherwise, you know, the banks will, everybody will just get a bailout. So I think it's healthy that this comes back and is in full, full swing. When we, when we first moved to the east side, you could buy lots. Vacant lots were $5,000 and vacant houses were $25,000. Development definitely started to escalate. Uh, properties started to get buy, bought up really quickly. Um, people that were traditionally, you know, renters and landlords were just, you know, given offers that they couldn't kind of refuse. It didn't happen overnight, but all of a sudden one day you woke up and there's like, man, there's no place for people to live like on the east side at all. San Antonio has become a real estate playground. We've all seen the We Buy Houses signs. In some parts of town, the text messages, the phone calls, the knocks on their doors, and all cash offers are nonstop. It's not just individual homes. One organization told us of an investor looking to buy up to 100 houses at once. Our city is changing. It's exciting, and there are upsides for some, but it's also happening so, so fast. San Antonio has become a marketplace for the world. From local developers to international investors, San Antonio is ripe for the picking.
I was born in Southtown in San Antonio, and I graduated in 2010 from architecture. And then I got two job offers in San Antonio. I worked um, new construction, renovation, additions, guest houses in the King William area, Terrell Hills. I worked on a lot of single family high end residential. It was fun to imagine with really generous budgets what was possible. That is a creative space that I don't take for granted, but the conversations about context in the neighborhood were never really at the forefront. I became more aware of the amount of control that developers and real estate investors have on how the city is continuing to grow or not grow. I was asking about community and impact and public meetings, and they're like, that's not what we were hired for. And I was like, well, maybe it should be, right? My departure, my transition from architecture I think really came out of how, in my experience, traditional architecture um, felt really about an individual and not about a collective. Uh, I moved away to do affordable housing uh, work. I was a nonprofit affordable housing developer in the Boston area for about three years. So I moved back because San Antonio passed the strategic housing implementation plan and because of the affordable housing bond. It was voted on and approved the week that I started. I, I moved back for this role to be the community engagement administrator in the neighborhood and housing services department to make sure that we were listening as we continue to develop affordable housing. Um, wanted to make sure programs and services were informed by community. And I also wanted to make sure communities were actually utilizing our programs and services. Affordable housing bond is not going to solve all of the housing affordability issues in the city, right? It's, it's a tool, it's a start. It is an opportunity for developers to leverage funding to produce more housing affordability so more people can be housed. Um, it's also an opportunity for people to remain in their homes, right? So if you have a repair that you need in your home, you're able to do that so that you can spend other money on taxes or you can spend money on food or you can spend money on education. What are the ways in which we are preserving already existing affordable housing? This is too complex of an issue for any one solution. Too important to get stuck and too urgent to wait for someone else to solve. It's made me rethink things like my own investments and whether I should use short-term rentals when I travel. It's made me curious about what other creative solutions are out there. I've known about home building and home repair nonprofits, but now I'm learning about organizations using market and finance solutions to get affordable homes into the hands of families. I'm learning about mutual aid groups, helping neighbors pay rent when they can't make ends meet. I plan to keep learning about all the ways to stay engaged with housing. There is a way forward for us as a community. I know it will take many solutions over a long period of time. It's worth it, because at the end of the day, this is about our neighbors. Hi, Hi Mom. Hi. That was cool. It was great. It actually felt like a short day. It did. Mm -hmm. We have a home now, like she, she, this is her second year at the same school. She's starting to have some kind of sense of uh, like something that she's used to and not to where she has to think like, well, where are we going to be next month? I know, like, if I didn't have my daughter, I wouldn't be how I am today at all. She hasn't really had the chance to, to see me in a happy place. 
except for now. Because I have more stability in my life. I work. So things are finally better. I feel like that's, it's healing something in me because I never had that before. As long as I don't give up on myself that like, I'll, I'll get the help that I need and it's gonna be done and I don't have to continue that, that pattern. That's good, right? Uh, I mean, and then you can take so many parts of it and go deep, right? For hours and hours and days and days. But um, I just think it's a really good synopsis that we'll be able to utilize within our own communities to move things forward. Um, we're, we're a good dozen. I love a dozen. We're a good 12 of us. So, um, and it's 848. So, um, and I'm supposed to be in a recorded city meeting and on vacation all at the same time, <laughs> but I'm here with you. So I'm, I'm willing to stay on till nine. You all don't have to, but if there are thoughts, comments, whatever, the next two weeks, we are going to dive a little deeper into what is happening specifically in terms of congregations. I hope some of you took time to read the article from The Economist on whether or not congregations might be our hope in, I think it's part of it. It's a puzzle, right? But um, congregations do have uh, potential and we've got congregations who are stepping up to that. So I hope you read that article. So next week it will be more on congregations. In fact, there is a meeting at the Mennonite church in 11 minutes that if any of you wanted to go to, you could still jump in car, your car and go to it. But um, it's on what's called Good Futures, but it's specifically about congregations and looking at their facilities, their purpose, their community, and how might they better be serving. And we've got some amazing, amazing examples happening in our city. So um, that's open to the public and you could still go to that. So if you need to sign off, to go to the Mennonite Church at 1443 South um, South St. Mary's. I had to think of what the street was. Um, I'm sure you would be welcome. Um, and then the following week, Mark Carmona will be with us, and he'll be giving an update on SHIP and where it stands today, the Strategic Housing Implementation Plan. So thoughts, comments? Um, I put plenty. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very powerful video, and, it's, and it tells a very telling story about our city. Uh, and a lot of the things no Moss is going to talk about is going to be about those demic issues and you know generational issues and historical issues that that you know have a lot to do with this video. So, and how that also you know you know I, I saw one where they're going to talk about aces and how aces actually attributes to abuse and attributes to. Uh, violence you know when people are living in these conditions and they don't have you know the resources that you know people on other sides of town i mean just I mean, to this day just think about it east side has one high school on the east side of the seventh largest city in the in, in the united states how, how's that possible i mean really how's it possible so those are things that people like us need to bring up to you know the city and say hey guys when's things really going to change I mean, like I said, and like that one guy was saying, you go to the east side, you can't buy nothing. I, I can't afford to live on the east side. And I have two houses on the north side. You know, so yeah, it's really needs to change. There's, there's a lot that needs to be really deeply looked into. To... So we're not kicking out the people who started this place and been here forever and a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all connected. 
uh, all those things. But the point that uh, also comes true when we talk about like homelessness and uh, any of these conversations that having a home, a place to live, well, you have better chances on all, all fronts, right? of healing. So I'm David Zare and Randy, but I'm also putting in the link um, that I just ran it from. And you can also Google H.E. Butt Foundation and Know Your Neighbor. I mean, there's another website they've got too, but knowyourneighbor.com housing, that's where the video is. It's on YouTube. So um, you just Google it, but that's the link I was playing from this morning. So David, Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you, Anne. Uh, I, I that documentary was just absolutely powerful. And as people have been talking about some solutions uh, that is thrown around, I know that the as a trustee of the of a church on the east side that I'm a member of, uh, we have a set of of of, uh, of apartments that uh, we took a different approach in terms of how we do our our rent, if you will. Um, we took a model that was actually modeled by HEB when HEB has property that they sell, uh, much like a lot of the other grocery chains, they typically take do a 50 year uh, for 50 years. We'll, we'll sell you this property, but if for 50 years, you cannot have a grocery store built around on this development area uh, to compete with us with that, you know, that using that model, we sit here and say, hey, if you want to develop on our property by, or the, the things that we're gonna sell you, go ahead and develop. However, use the Pareto principle, take 20% of what you develop and make that affordable housing so that we would be in a position where, yes, you, you'll have those individuals that are, that are more mature in their, their business. I mean, in, in terms of you know, making their revenue, I mean, uh, their average median income high with the other individuals to have that community effect to where you are still uplifting the individuals that are trying to get up to the status where, you know, a lot of Americans are currently at. I wish that the city would take a look at that approach um, to where when we do give out these auctions, you know, take 20 percent, you know, at some point we have to take a look at the greed factor of capital and say, hey, can we can you guys just be willing to give? Sorry about that. 20% of, of your pardon. So, hey, Major, can you take 20% of the, you know, the property that you're going to develop on and make it affordable housing so that we would have a more inclusive and diverse uh, uh, people that are, that are moving into these communities and still make it very communal living. So thank you for the platform, Dr. Ann. I appreciate you. You know, this is fantastic and and uh, hope you enjoy your vacation. Uh I am. I am. Thank you. Randy, you have some thoughts, questions, whatever. Yeah. Um, I just I, I just want to throw out some thoughts here because this that was a very thought provoking film. Uh, I've been a real estate agent for 20 years and I've worked with investors, but I the market changes from time to time. So it's not always the same situation. I just want to say a couple of things that I don't believe that generational wealth is a house. Uh, I believe that generational wealth is an education. And if we, if if people can get financial education as to what owning is about, I mean, not everyone should own a house. And I, I don't. People get into houses and then they don't understand the add-ons that come with it. It's not just that mortgage payment. You know, it's God Almighty, it's just so many different things that you have to be involved with. And, and then I'm, I also want to say, you know, this idea about private property, eminent domain, if a city comes in or if the county or the state comes in and want to run a railroad track through your land, hmm, you're probably going to have a railroad track run through your land. That's the way that that works. And the developers... This is the way that the, the land grabs work. Money talks, big money talks real loud. And so if you have a section up there north of town, you say, oh, we're not going to build here because it's over the aquifer. You just wait. You just watch it and see who builds and who doesn't build 
over an aquifer. Uh, right now, there's a situation going up on, I mean, these are big town problems, but they're little town problems too. Uh, and up in Spring Branch right now, you see these big tracts of land and then a little sign goes up, 500 houses coming, 900 houses on the next corner. It's incredible what is going on 45 minutes from downtown. The way that it affects us is uh, kind of a delayed reaction. But if those houses are all sitting over on top of an aquifer that is drying up, what happens? What happens? What happens when you get neighborhoods that are abandoned? And then you have, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've got, we, we, we live in a house downtown and, and uh, with the downtown church, you see street people all the time that um, need information on how to get out of the rut. I think, I think you know very well that, that, um, uh, Haven for Hope has been great in getting, helping people get a leg up and figure out how to get back, you know, in the, you know, into housing again. But it is really, it's really a complicated issue. It's it's so, um, you know, in the financial education, it's also computer access, like that lady on the film was talking about. If you can't get onto a computer and figure this stuff out, my next door neighbor here is like just uh, downtown. I'm talking about. He's just, you know, because he's on disabilities and he cannot figure out how to get through the paperwork. He just, you know, he's a nice guy. You know, he's a nice guy, and, and we try to help. But who, who, who can sit down and work with someone and help them get through the programs that they need? that are there already. Anyway. I think it's one of those gaps in service that, um, I mean, we can, you know, point like to government and say that's a gap, right? But I also think the faith community could fill that gap. Uh -huh. There was one guy at Haven for Hope, his name was Floyd. And man, one, he was the kindest, sweetest. Um, he, he did his he listened to everybody and he often said you know floyd man you're the most human machine i've ever seen he never stopped mm -hmm. and the work that he did is exactly what you're describing randy was paperwork of whatever kind uh -huh. and whatever people needed i mean i don't know how to make my way through paperwork I'm employed. I have some place to live. I have computer access. I still can't make it through the insanity. Uh -huh. And, I and know. right. We need access like that. I noticed we're one minute out. Um, and, and I might leave it open, but I, I might sign out of here, but I'm putting into uh chat. Um, one of the things that I picked up in that economist article is the shifting of the geography of our own minds. You know, like what, what do we have to shift up here in order to move here, right? And here, and what, what, is, what is my role? What, what is our role? You know, and, and it can be lots of different things, speaking out to things built over the aquifer. That could be part of my role. Um, connecting different partners that could help a congregation finally become an, an asset, a true asset to the community that they're in, right? And we've got examples of that. But I love that whole shift from not in my backyard to yes, in God's backyard. What if just the people of faith shifted their own mental geography into um, being the neighbor? Be the neighbor. Right, that you want to yes. see. Yes. You know, be the neat neighbor that um, you want to be treated. You know, be that neighbor that will treat other neighbors the way you want to be treated. Be that neighbor that doesn't treat people in ways you wouldn't want to be treated yourself. Or be that when neighbor you want to love as yourself. How's that? Right. I mean, you can change that, however, but it's got to do, we've got to do that. And if we make that shift, and the shift is happening nationally. I don't think it's happening to everybody, but it is happening nationally within congregations. There is a movement 
I have congregations going, oh, wait, <laughs> I remember why we're here. Oh, yes. Right? Wow. It's to serve people. It's to be a spot that forms and shapes and loves and nurtures community. It's the place where people talk about the real stuff. It's the place where not only they're able to go for their spiritual health, but for their emotional health and maybe even their physical health. Maybe it's a place, you know, you know, we go like maybe, and it's like, how did we forget that? Right. I'm going to go to Peter last hand. It's nine Oh two. Yep. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, sure. I'll keep it brief, but I uh, just okay. I really appreciate the comments that came before and just wanted to share, uh, what I what you just said in in I think a very succinct way the proximity the impact I was on the housing bond committee and uh, and worked with the ship and and Randy thanks for that uh, perspective social services and the so supportive services and navigators empowering them in community to be able to impact that transition or that transformation in community is so powerful and resiliency the projects we're working in with the city right now, I think that's got to be at the heart of where the faith community really engages and moves people through this whole process, but in close proximity to where we live and with communities of faith engaged completely in all aspects, but with navigators. To me, I think navigators being empowered, those trusted agents, they can really help people transition in those hard places. And I think if we do that consistently in our, in our local churches, uh, we'll see a change. And I, I just love this work that we're, we're engaged in. And I see mm -hmm. the po powerful video, um, very empowering. And um, I look forward to seeing the transformation of those uh, faith communities within close proximity. Yeah. I've challenged uh, the HE Bet Foundation to make similar things. Uh, I mean, they have a lot of emphasis on mental health. So I'm like, make one of those on mental health. You know, make one of those on, you know, let's make our list, right? But if we had series like that, just that kind of awareness and knowledge would really help. I'm signing off <laughs> and I want to invite all of you to get into and onto your days as well. I'll see you next week, though, when we will specifically talk more about congregations and what's happening in our cities. Love you all. Have great weekends. Amen. I'll talk to you later. Everybody Bye. have a blessed day.